Welcome to Abergavenny Baptist Church. We're now going to have our Bible reading, which is from Matthew chapter 6 and verses 5 to 15. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full, but when you pray, go to your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins. Well, we're continuing our series through the Lord's Prayer, where we're looking at the Lord's Prayer line by line. And last week, we looked at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10, which says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And there are actually two requests there. Firstly, your kingdom come, and then secondly, your will be done. But they're intimately connected, and so we we looked at them together last week. But we focused more on the line, your kingdom come. And this week, we're going to focus more on the line, your will be done. But that's not entirely accurate. Uh, As we've seen, all of these requests have both a, a global dimension and a personal dimension. So when we pray, hallowed be your name, we are praying that all people all across the globe would hallowed God's name, that they would worship God, that they would adore God, that they would treasure God more than anything else. A global dimension. But we also pray, when we pray, hallowed be your name, we also pray that we would hallowed God's name, that we would worship God and adore God and treasure God above anything else in our life, a personal dimension. So it is both a global and a personal dimension. And last week, we focused on the global dimension of your kingdom come and your will be done, on God's kingdom breaking into the world and overcoming evil through love, and establishing God's kingdom, God's rule and reign on, on, on earth, the, the, the global dimension. But before we can see God's kingdom breaking into our communities and our nation and our world, we first have to see God's kingdom and God's world breaking into our life. See, that's where it starts. It starts with God's kingdom and God's will being done in me, in my life. That's where it starts, and that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Now, I used to think this was a prayer of resignation. You you know what I mean? We go before God, and we say, God, we ask God, can I have this, and and can can you do this, and, and that, And then with a shrug of the shoulders, we say, but your will be done. It's kind of like saying, well, I guess God is going to do what God is going to do. And there's not much I can do about it. So I I guess I'm just going to have to accept it. Your will be done. A prayer of resignation. But, But this is not a prayer of resignation. When we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, we pray that it will be done on this little piece of earth, this little bit of dust, me, that, that your will, your kingdom and your will will break into my life. It's a way of saying, God, may you be the king of my life. You see, the question is, who is the king of your life? Who is the boss of your life? Who who makes all the decisions? Who decides what you do? 
Now, most of us, I think if we're going to be honest, most of us will have to confess, I'm the king of my life. I'm the boss of my life. I like to do what I want to do, when I want to do, how I, and how I want to do it. And I get very frustrated if I can't. I want to be independent. I want to have control. And so this is a prayer of submission. Surrendering. Surrendering control. Surrendering your life over to God. Saying to God, my life is no longer mine. It's yours. I surrender control of my life over to you. For better or worse, for richer or poorer, I give you my life. My life is now at your disposal. It's no longer my life. It's your life. You are mine and I am yours. Prayer of submission. Now, most of us, for most of us, that is like your worst nightmare. It's like, that's like the worst thing you could ever pray. Because we like to be in control of our own life. We like to be independent. We like to be our own boss. We want to be the king of our life. We want to do what we want, when we want. And we want happiness and, and prosperity and pleasure. And uh, if in order to have that and ensure we have that, then we need to be in control. We need to be the ones who decide what's best for our life because we know what's best for our life. Our prayer is not your will be done, but my will be done. Right? So how can we pray this prayer? How can we pray your will be done in my life? Well, we can only pray this prayer if you know God as your Abba Father. Very significant that we first have to address God as our Heavenly Father before we get to the line about your will be done. That's because it's only when you know God as your Heavenly Father, as your Abba Father, that you'll be able to pray your will be done. In Mark chapter 14 and verse 36, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He, he's, he's just about to be arrested, falsely accused, and crucified. And he knows this is going to happen. And so he's in the Garden, and he's praying, and he prays, Abba, Father. He, he knows God intimately. He knows God as his Abba, Father, his loving Father. He's his daddy. And he prays, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. In other words, spare me from this death. You see, the last thing in the world that Jesus wanted was to experience this gruesome death. Death by crucifixion is one of the most painful ways to die. But far more painful than the physical pain Far more painful than the emotional pain of being betrayed and deserted by your friends was the spiritual pain Jesus would experience on the cross. For on the cross, all evil comes upon Jesus. All sin comes upon Jesus. And on the cross, Jesus experiences what it's like to be forsaken by God. He experiences what it's like to be totally rejected by his Father. Far more than the nails in his hands was the pain in his heart. And so he prays, take this cup from me. Spare me from this death. But then he prays, yet, not what I will, but what you will. How can he pray that? The only reason he can pray that is because he knows God as Abba Father. That affirms Jesus' love and devotion to his Father, but it also affirms God's love and devotion and care for Jesus. And this is the context of all real prayer. We come before our Abba Father, our Dad in heaven who loves us and cares for us and wants what is best for us and knows what is best for us. 
In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, we told that God's world is his good, pleasing, and perfect world. God knows what is best for you. And God wants what is best for you. So we can trust God. And so it's only when we know God as Abba Father that we're able to pray, Your will be done in my life. And of course, we're only able to pray that prayer when we know that we owe God our life. We owe God our life. You see, when we realize that Jesus prayed, yet not what I will, but what you will, he he prayed that for us. He experienced that gruesome death for us. Because he loves us so much, he was prepared to die for us. Through his death, God pays the price to rescue us from evil, sin, and death so that we can experience freedom and forgiveness and life, eternal life. God paid the price. It cost him his life. And when we realize that, we will realize that we owe God our life. And that's why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 19 to 20, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. God loves you so much that he died for you. And when we realize that, we realize that we owe God our life. Very interestingly, Jesus is the only person in the history of the world to ever pray, yet not what I will, but what you will, when he didn't owe anything. You see, when we pray, not not what I will, but what you will, we owe God everything. Jesus didn't owe anyone anything. Jesus could have so easily have said, why should I die for them? They don't appreciate what I'm doing. They don't deserve what I'm doing. They will never be able to repay me for what I'm doing. I owe them nothing. He had every right to say that. But because he loves us, because he loves us so much, he prays, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he dies for us. He dies for you. And so we owe him everything. Praying, your will be done, is the heart of all prayer. Surrendering is the heart of all prayer. It's the purpose and the point of all prayer is to come before God and surrender to His will. Now, so often we think, we think the purpose and the point of all prayer is to get God to surrender to our will. To to get God to do what we want. We think the point and the purpose of all prayer is for God to align His will with our will. For God to say, oh, all right then. Not my will be done. Your will be done. We think that's the point of prayer. But the heart of prayer, the heart of all prayer, is aligning our will with God's will. There's an alignment of wills. Our will becomes in line with God. And that's only achieved when we wrestle with God in prayer. In Mark chapter 14 and verse 36, Jesus pleads with God, Take this cup from me. Spare me from this death. It's more of a struggle. It's more of an argument than a request. He's demanding Everything is impossible for you, God, so take this cup away. Jesus is effectively saying there must be another way. There must be another way to provide forgiveness for these people where I don't have to die and and nobody has to get nailed to anything. 
And what we discover here is, is there's this, this argument. God is having this argument with himself. There must be another way. And in the silence, we can hear the Father say, No. Sorry. But no. There is no other way. It's not possible. There is no other way. The only way we can deal with sin and evil and still have a relationship with people who have evil in their heart is to die for them. And then Jesus comes to his final line. Yet not what I will, but what you will. It's only through this this very real, this very vulnerable, this very honest prayer. It's only through wrestling with God in prayer like that that we get to the point where we can say, not what I will, but what you will. It's the heart of prayer. See, prayer is not about changing God. It's about changing us. Prayer is not about changing circumstances and situations. It's about changing us. So often, when I'm facing a very challenging situation, a very difficult situation, and I'm bringing it to God in prayer, more often than not, it's very rare that the situation will change. Normally what happens is I change. I experience peace. I experience more grace from God and more strength from God to face the situation and get through the situation. And I'm able to say, not what I will, but what you will. It's a prayer of surrender. But it's also a prayer of commission. It's also the way we sign on for the kingdom of God. It's the way we sign up to be part of the Jesus revolution. You see, the kingdom of God is all about overcoming evil in the world through love and establishing God's kingdom, God's rule and reign on earth. But this revolution starts with us. It starts within us. You see, every one of us has evil in our heart. We all have selfishness, self-centeredness, and greed in our heart. We constantly want more and more. We constantly want our way. We want everyone to do things our way. We want our will to be done. We have evil in our heart. Ever since the beginning, ever since Adam and Eve, the first human couple, people have turned their backs on God and said, I want to do things my way, not God's way. And we've prayed, not your will be done, but my will be done. This has been the root cause of all the problems in the world. This has been the root cause of all evil and suffering in the world is human rebellion. And so when we pray, your will be done, we're overcoming the evil within our own heart. And we've been restored to our rightful place. You see, true humanity, real humanity, restored humanity is a humanity who prays, not my will be done, but your will be done. And it leads to freedom. You say, what? (laughs) How does that lead to freedom? Surely that just makes us a slave to God. Surely we're only free when we're doing what we want to do. I mean, that's what most people think. But that just leads to slavery. You'll be enslaved to selfishness and greed. You'll be constantly wanting more and more. You'll be constantly wanting to get things done your way and always have things done your way. But you'll never be satisfied. You'll always be wanting more. You'll never be satisfied. And it will lead to to 
broken relationships, resentment, anger, and ultimately death. You will be enslaved to sin, evil, and death. But when you pray, your will be done in my life, you'll find freedom. You'll be set free from evil, sin, and death, and you will be free to become everything God has created you to be. I mean, when is a bird truly free? Is a bird truly free when it decides, well, I want to do what I want to do. I don't want to fly. I want to swim. Okay, unless it's a duck. Okay, but let's assume it's not a duck. Okay, let's assume it's an eagle. Is an eagle truly free if it decides, well, I don't want to fly. I want to do whatever I want to do, and I want to swim. Is it free? Of course not. It'll be a lousy, lousy swimmer. It'll drown. It's only free when it's free to do what it was created to do. It's only free when it's soaring in the sky. And it's the same for us. We're not free if, if we just doing whatever we want to do. We're only free when we're doing what we were created to do. And we were created to know God as our Abba Father. And to do his will. To say, your will be done in my life. That's what we were created for. That's when we're free. And it leads to life. And Jesus says in Mark chapter 8 and verses 34 to 35, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. Deny themselves means saying, not my will be done. Taking up your cross is about dying to self. It's about saying, I no longer live, but Jesus lives through me. It's about saying, I no longer live for, for making money and, and being prosperous and, and pleasure or, or for recognition and status or popularity or anything else. I'm not living for that anymore. I'm living for Jesus. Most people think that, well, that, that's terrible. That sounds awful. Dying to self. That sounds terrible. That's because we're hedonists. We think the most important thing in life is seeking pleasure and happiness. And that unless you're seeking pleasure and happiness, you will never be fulfilled. And so we, we constantly wanting to have a nice car, a nice job, a nice house, all the latest gadgets, going on exotic holidays and having the most fashionable clothes and the like. Because if we don't have all of this, if we're not seeking this life, then, and, and pleasure and happiness, well then, well, you know, we'll, we'll be miserable. But Jesus says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever seeks after pleasure and happiness, whoever seeks the, the hedonistic lifestyle, will lose their life. You will never be satisfied. You will be miserable. And ultimately, you will die. And you can't take your money with you. You will lose your life. You see, Jesus doesn't say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for pleasure. If you... If you're hungry and thirsty after pleasure, if you're trying to seek pleasure and happiness, you will never find pleasure and happiness. You'll always be miserable. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who, who hunger and thirst for God and, and hunger and thirst to do what is right. Those who deny themselves, take up their cross and follow Jesus. They will find life, real life. Now, this doesn't mean you're going to have an easy life. It doesn't mean you're going to have lots of money and, and prosperous and, and, and everything's going to go great. No, Jesus doesn't offer us or promise us an easy life. Far from it. Denying yourself, taking up your cross and following Jesus is not easy, but it's extremely rewarding. 
It's the most rewarding life. And ultimately it leads to eternal life. It also leads to making a difference for the kingdom of God. That's why it's so rewarding, because it's got eternal consequences. What's God's will for us? We're praying, your will be done. What what is God's will for our life? God's will is that we would be like Jesus. That we would follow Jesus. That we would carry our cross like Jesus. You see, Jesus opens up a whole new way of being human. A whole new way of being human. A way of sacrificial love. A a way of servant leadership where where, where the, the leader serves the servant, washes the servant's feet. Where those who are last are first. The way of forgiveness and loving our enemies. The way of humility where we put other people's interests above ourselves. A way of equality where no one is discriminated on the basis of of gender or race or religion or sexuality or social class. But everyone is welcomed and included. A way of standing up against injustice and inequality. A way of overcoming evil with love. The way of proclaiming God's love, sharing God's love with all people. This is what it means to pray, your will be done in my life. It means we live like this. And this doesn't lead to an easy life. Far from it. This is not easy. And when you start living like this, evil won't like it. Evil in other people's hearts won't like it. It got Jesus crucified. It's not easy. But it's extremely rewarding. And it leads to eternal consequences. And ultimately to eternal life. So are you prepared to pray this prayer? Our Father in heaven, your will be done in my life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, forgive us for the times where we just pray the Lord's prayer without even taking it in. We say it's so quickly and so easily without actually reflecting on what we say. And Father, we confess that it's not easy to pray that prayer. And in some ways, we, we think that's like the worst thing ever. <laughs> it goes so against our grain. And Father, we confess that there is selfishness in us. We like to be in control. We like to get our own way. We like to be, be our own boss. We think we know what is best. Father, please forgive us. Please help us to come to a point where we know you as our Abba Father, where we know that you are our loving Father in heaven and we can trust you with our life and we lay our life down for you, in front of you because because we love you and because we owe you everything and we trust you completely and we want to be everything you created us to be and called us to be. And so, Father, help us to pray, your will be done and mean it. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for listening to our podcast. For more information about Abergavenny Baptist Church, please visit our website at abergavennybaptist.co.uk.